welcome to Shop Talks, which is a production of the In Kitchen. Check us out on YouTube. Check out InKitchen.com. Got sponsors. Check them out. They make this free. Impressions Magazine, Impressions Show. Thanks to them. We're going to talk about water-based printing and some tips and tricks. This will get recorded, and you'll be able to watch it at a later time as well. Share it with your friends. Um, I've got Tony Palmer here from the UK. I've got Danny Gruninger, who lives in Colorado, and Eric and Val, who are from Houston, Texas. And um, they're all longtime water-based printers, still standing. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some tips and tricks about water-based printing. So, uh, and uh, hey, but we'll start with you two guys. You're actually printing here at the show, and uh, um, actually all of you are, right? Yeah, so actually, if you can follow them back to their, their, their workplaces here <laughs> for the last three days, you can probably talk to them more as well, right? You guys are open to it. Um, let's uh, talk, let's start with what you hear from people about why they can't do it and some answers to that. What's the first thing you hear when someone says, uh, you know, you say you do water-based printing and they say they, they don't do it because of X, Y, or Z? Cheers. I think uh, one, of the, one of the preconceptions is it's difficult. It, it's not plastisol. If you go from plastisol to water-based, that's the fear. Is you know, I want to treat it like plastisol, but it keeps making my life difficult. So I think that's probably the biggest preconception is that it's you can just swap out from one plastisol range into a water-based range and not change anything, uh, and that, that's wrong. You 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 have to make some changes. Um, it, it's it's a bit of a fear, a bit scared. But I've got examples of the same thing the other way. It's true water-based printers who've never seen plastisol, you give them a tub of, of Rutland and they hate it and they try and clean it with water and it won't go through the mesh and they've got the wrong count and, and, and they think it's, it's like the work of the devil, they hate it. So it's all about your per perception of where you start and how you're gonna change. Yeah, I think to echo off what Tony said, what I've seen with the shops that I work, work with and when I first made that transition of Plastisol to water base is Plastisol is really forgiving. So if you have bad screens, you don't really see it. You can put a screen up on the press and print, you know, a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand shirts and that, that screen looks pretty much like it uh, was new. Um, with water base, you're, it's not forgiving. If you don't have good screens, you'll start printing and 20, 30, 50 shirts later, you're gonna have breakdown. If and not two. You, <laughs> yeah, and you're, you're scrambling thinking, uh, you know, what, what do I do? How do I fix this? And then you're battling ink drying on the press. Um, so really, Plastisol is just a lot more forgiving, but if you have those variables controlled and dialed in, if you make good screens, water base is actually very easy. Um, so I think it just starts with the fundamentals. If you, if you have good screens, if you have, uh, you know, good documentation, water base is not that hard to, to uh, print with. Push the to button. follow up on uh, what Danny's saying, there, there's no cheating in water base. It's gonna, you know, you, you really have to have things controlled. And no crying either, right? <laughs> yeah, no crying. Well, no, actually a lot um, of crying, but. <laughs> but yeah, if, if you don't have things dialed, you're gonna find out very quickly that, you know, you're, you're gonna start seeing failure, whether it's screen breakdown or, you know, color shifting, ink drying, there's all sorts of little things. But, you know, this is not necessarily something that people come up to me and say, it's kind of the opposite. When we started printing water base, it made us better printers because we started to understand things way more because we were forced to. And uh, not to say that people don't want to do that homework, but it does require a little bit of like understanding and knowledge and kind of piecing the puzzle together to really get that full picture of what is it that needs to happen. You're working in a really small window where like, like you say with forgiving with Plastisol, it, it's, you, you've got a good opportunity to not get it absolutely perfect, yeah. but that window gets smaller and smaller with water-based, and like you say, all those little variables, they will trip you up and you'll think it's you. You'll think it's, some, it's the water-based ink, I can't print with it because it always breaks down. Yeah. So it's all those little things making that window smaller. 
So if you're going from Plastel to Waterbase, what are some of the changes that uh, one would expect to have to make in their processes besides them getting better? <laughs> I mean, screens, right? Everything starts with the screen and emulsion. If you're not using a water-resistant emulsion or if your emulsion is not properly cured or cross-linked, that's right there, you're instantly doomed. It just doesn't seem like that should be that hard, is it? I mean, you just have to get a water-based emulsion, right? Or is it, am I missing something? I mean, there, there's a little bit more to it than that, but... I know, you know there's post-hardening that is uh, helpful. There's, all, of there's all sorts of little tricks that you can do, but it's like once you have the understanding, the fundamentals of how to make a screen kind of down, like in our shop and Danny are probably the same way, we make a screen, we expose it, there's no hardener, we don't even post-expose. And, you know, we do thousands of prints on the same screen, detailed halftones, there, there's no degradation in it. I mean, do you find that most of the major suppliers that are reputable, you know, like a, a Saudi or SPSI or, uh, you know, any number of other people are, are going to give you good, the starter good advice about what emulsion to, to get and how to use it? Is that pretty yeah. much out there or not? Yeah, these days? I mean, and, and you can request that information too. It's like, we got started because Keith Perkins from, from Saudi came in, spent a whole day with us and helped us dial it in. That was 12 years ago. And we've been on the same, almost, we've been in the same emulsion family since then. So we, there's no reason for us to deviate from it. Yeah, that's one, one thing I was gonna say is you guys need to rely on those vendors to help support you in your shop. Every single one of them, Chromaline, Saudi, you know, they all have really qualified reps that will come in and teach you how to make a really quality screen. Um, so tap into it and use it. Um, one thing about the transition from Plastisol to water base for me that was a big hurdle, I guess, to overcome was dealing with uh, dot loss versus dot gain. So with Plastisol, you know, you're always, uh, you know, you're, you're smashing the ink, gain, you're getting gain on press. Um, before you know it, you're you know, 65 line count looks like a 30 line count because you're just mashing your dots. And uh, so for me, understanding how to control the difference between water-based dot loss and Plastisol dot gain. So when I made the transition, I started, I had a lot of reprints of simulated process designs that my clients needed me to match. So I spent a lot of time linearizing, doing test prints, making sure that when you visually look at the shirt, my water-based prints match the Plastisol. So I think that was the biggest thing that uh, was a transition for me. I, yeah, I'm not much to add really. I, I wanna know how you made a water-based look as bad as a Plastisol. <laughs> <laughs> Danny's, Danny's very talented, Tony. He should know this. <laughs> So what are some advantages of water base, actually? How about that? The feel. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing. Like, uh, I, you know, you can get close if you're very dialed with Plastisol, right? I mean, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the ink companies have come a long way bridging both kind of together in a way. So, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of the ink systems, when they would, when you would mix a Pantone, you look at it in the cup, you would say, what the hell? Like, this looks nothing close to what I'm actually gonna get on the shirt. Where ink companies are doing a better job of, you know, you, you see the ink in the cup, that's what you're gonna get on the shirt. Just like with Plastisol, they're making Plastisol better to where it mimics water base in a way. So I think they're trying to kind of play that game of, you know, how do we make the best ink possible? Um, and a lot comes down to the hand, but with Plastisol, if you print it well, it's, it still has a really good hand. For me, the transition was water-based, you can do anything. There's no limits with special effects. Um, if you wanna print HDs or Phlox foils or uh, 120 line count with fluorescence and metallics, water-based allows you to do that. Plastisol, you're definitely limited by the ink. So from a trying to strive to be the highest level printer, water base allows me, or it gives me a better uh, foundation to do that. Yeah, I would say like it's kind of, you have infinite options. <laughs> you, you have that customization, you're able to like, you, you want that color, just play around with some pigments. Yeah, and, and like on uh, polyester, it's really good. Dye blockers, I think, for water base are much 
better than plastisol dye blockers. So I think there's a lot of applications in terms of the garment itself. Water-based lends itself uh, much more so than plastisol. For me, I think you've got to ask yourself why. Why, why, are you, why do you want to use water-based? Is it about the customer? Are they demanding a more retail feel? Or is it you? Do you care about the turtles and dolphins? What's the driving factor? Because it's not going to be the same. You're not going to be as productive in the beginning as you are with your plastisol. So there's a price to pay, and you've got to ask yourself, well, why? Am I going to charge more for my prints? In which case, yeah, the, the ink is not quite as expensive as plastisol. And if I can charge more for it, then it becomes more profitable. But if I'm doing it because the customer demands, the, the retail field, the green tick, if you like, then I can charge that customer even more for a, an organic product. But if it's from my own beliefs and, and my desire to not have a, a big impact on the environment, then I've got to pay the cost. I've got to pay the, the price for being more sustainable. Easier cleanup, yes, than plastic Yes, I think so. Right? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's much easier. You know, the. Maybe you want to describe it because some people just really haven't seen water based that are plastic printers. What, what's, the, what's the cleanup typically like? Uh, yeah, so the, cl the cleanup uh, in my facility was always uh, screens come off the press. Uh, the workers that are working on the press, they don't touch those. They just go back into an area. The area has a dip tank of water. Um, ink gets carted back into the cups, screen goes into the dip tank of water, and uh, from that point on we just use water to, to clean the ink. Um, you know, obviously we'll do... But what about the poor petrochemical industry? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, no chemicals. It's uh, the, the employees over the years that I've had that were plastisol printers that transitioned to water base they'll all tell you we never want to go back to Plastisol for the cleanup. Sort of like spray tech. <laughs> yeah, just like spray tech. <laughs> um, actually, what, so what about spray tech? Is it change? Uh, what's the deal with uh, keeping the shirt on the platen while you're printing it? Well, the big thing with water base, especially when you get into multicolor, like high solid acrylic or discharge, is really controlling the flash and the heat of your platens. And so there are applications where we do need to use spray tack, but we try and use water-based adhesive as much as possible. But water-based adhesive, when it's wet, it's not sticky, it doesn't stick down. And if your palettes are too hot, your ink is off-gassing not only up, but also down into the palette. So it's again, it's just like, it's maintaining it, it's making sure you're controlling the variables. But you know, we use water-based adhesive, uh, we've used solvent, we use web spray, I mean, all, all of it works fine for, for that. It's a small enigma with, with tack because the best thing for the job is a can of solvent-based spray. It is the best thing for the job, but it's the worst thing for the press, it's the worst thing for the environment, it's the worst thing for the staff. So to make those changes, we have to lose a little bit of the, of the, the power of the adhesive, unfortunately. Uh, I still always keep a can of spray tack just there just in case for that that fleece job that just won't stick uh, or for to, to just solve a problem really quickly uh, it's horrible on the uh, on the machines on the press certainly if you've got like a digital uh, head or something in there you don't want spray glue in the air it's horrible for the people breathing it in all day you know you don't want to pull 3,000 shirts off and have different colored bogies every day it's not nice so it, it's got it's got better for everybody else, but probably worse at holding the shirt onto the plant, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, we're all big proponents of water-based glue. Um, specifically printing water-based ink with water-based palette tack, you can run into issues uh, when you're printing discharge, like Eric was saying, you have off-gassing of the ink that's not only going up, but it's going down into the palette. So I don't know if any of you guys out there, you struggle with, maybe a long discharge run where you're trying to print wet on wet and your ink's starting to go through and it's gumming up, making your palette, um, you're losing the tack and your palette, the, the glue's starting to shift. Um, always recommend solvent-based adhesive for that. So when we run discharge in our shop, we run a solvent base. When we would run 
a normal HSA plastisol, we would run uh, standard water-based glue. All right, I think, anything else you want to say before we have questions? I, I think it's important to note that just because it's water-based, it doesn't always equate to eco-friendly. And I think that that is a big misconception. And as someone that only prints water-based, I, I try very carefully to, to tread on that subject. When people ask me, I say, do you want to drink it? Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and quite honestly, I mean, Danny I have made an ink you can drink, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But it's like Danny could probably speak to this more than we can. But it's like, at the end of the day, like, the, the way, the, the amount of waste that HSA or discharge creates, like, I, I think it's very debatable whether it actually is eco-friendly. And so back to Tony's point, it's like, what are you doing that for? If you're doing it because you want an eco-friendly organic material and you're using only low solids, great. But other aggressive water bases are, are not that way. You need to also uh, look at the big picture. <laughs> you know, if you're doing it every day like you are, you're gonna use the ink up, for example. We, long time ago, when it was not very prevalent, we had a hard time getting high solid acrylic white. We did a giant job of like 25,000 shirts, and we were gonna be penalized if we didn't get the whole thing done with that kind of ink. So we ended up buying like 22 gallons more than we needed, which we then about a year later threw into the trash. That is not ecological. Yeah. And it came in plastic pails, too. It was like, you know, it's, uh, you gotta look at the whole picture, so thanks for mentioning that. Um, how about uh, questions? We're gonna have to give up a mic here too, right? Who has a question? Is that one not working? Yeah. Questions? You got the experts on water-based printing here. Um, <clears throat> with so many clears in Matsui, um, what, what do you guys recommend? I know that it depends on what you're printing, whether it's discharge or HSA, but should you get a clear for each one of those, like a clear discharge and a clear for your HSA as well, um, and a white? Um, I guess how many bases would you recommend if you're trying to do water base um, for everything, not just for discharge or for that? <laughs> Val's the uh, chemist amongst us. Yeah. Um, I would recommend getting a clear and a white Specifically, if you're specifically talking about discharge and um, HSA, um, you're going to need to have those different bases for sure. Um, but what it comes down to is is what you're printing on and really doing the R and D on your end. Um, talk to your reps, um, whoever you're getting ink from, and kind of get some information from them and what they recommend. But ultimately you've got to test it in your shop to see what works for you and what works for that garment. All right, other questions? Uh, so, so what do you think about like Diazo versus like SPQ or like a pho pure photopolymer? So emulsions, what about emulsions? We, we use Diazo in every screen in our shop. Um, I think Diazo and, and dual cures are kind of the way to go. Uh, they help with the resolution, but they also help with screen durability when it's exposed correctly. Um, and so, I mean, at least in our shop, every screen has diazo in it. You, you know, I don't care if you say it. What, what emulsions do you use? Or we're, I mean, we're a, we're a Sati shop, so we use the Sati H, uh, PHU family. Um, we have for a really long time. Um, so SPQ versus dual cure, Diazo, all that. Um, I think the technology's come so so far with these emulsion companies. Like when I first started, I tested hundreds and hundreds, and you would see a pretty big difference. Where now, you know, you can get a product from Sati, Chromaline, um, and they're all pretty similar. Um, I did a run. Murakami actually came out with an emulsion called T9. If you're familiar with that, maybe seven or eight years ago, SBQ, the first run that I did with it was 26,000 pieces, front and back, no Diazo, um, no hardener, nothing. And that was just an SBQ emulsion. Um, so in terms of if your exposure's right, your developing's right, uh, I don't think you'll have any issues with durability. Diazo gives you a lot more latitude, and when you're trying to hold more detail, fine lines, um, I'm a big fan of having the Diazo. So even if you're running an SBQ, I like the addition of Diazo in that emulsion. Um, right now, I'm running CP Techs in my shop. 
I, I don't run a shop, so I don't run One Emulsion. What I do see is all of them being used everywhere. And the thing that drives me insane is I can put an emulsion into one shop and it works perfectly. And they get the 26,000, no problem, everything's great. And I put it exactly the same in another shop two miles away and it fails after 100 pieces. And trying to find out why the emulsion failed when you know that the emulsion is good and you know that it, it, it will last, but then you start to investigate the light source, the humidity, the cleaning, the chemicals, the tension, all these little things that make the emulsion look bad when really it's not those. It's the other little things that, that contribute to it. I would say definitely the tech rep that goes with your emulsion. They, they don't come in a little packet that's attached to the bucket, but um, you want to trust the people that you're working with because only people that don't do anything don't have a problem. So we all have problems at times, and to figure it out yourself is just so much more work without somebody on the other side that cares about it. Somebody that will be honest that the emulsion went bad. I, I have, I, we use uh, Kiwo a lot. They're as good as it gets. I've had a bad, you know, I've worked long enough that I've had a bad gallon of emulsion. Something has gone wrong. So you want to work with a reputable co company. And I will also say, and I know they will all agree, to save money on emulsion would be the dumbest fucking thing you would ever do. <laughs> Definitely, I agree. I mean, everything starts with a good screen. <laughs> everything starts at right, that, right there. If, if you, it's no good getting all the dots out if it fails after 20 prints. It, 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 you have to invest in an emulsion, but I think it's got to be one that works for you. And like you say, get the tech recs in, involved. How many different types of emulsion are there? You know, there, there are hundreds. So you have to find the one that works for you. All right, more questions? Uh, she, Amy's coming with a mic. Um, about printing wet on wet, um, sometimes I find that um, my, my sequence, it'll pick up from the previous screen. And then that means going around and flashing again, because I only have one flash in my press. Um, I just wondered what you guys' experience is on wet on wet. All right, so tips on wet on wet printing. What type, what type of machine are you using? Are you automatic or? Yeah, I, I'm on an auto and m &R, but I only have one flash. Lots of, tips on, lots of tips on this one. Uh, okay, so uh, I haven't run uh, m and in about a year or so, so forgive me if this is outdated, but really, I mentioned it previously, controlling your heat. That's really, really important. With one flash, and would you agree, it's probably a, a little tricky. It could definitely be done, depending on the size of the press. How, how big is the machine? How, how many stations or how many heads? Okay. Okay, so probably like six, eight sportsmen, diamondback, something like that. Yeah, so with one flash, you, you should be totally fine. But basically, I mean, you want to control the heat of the platens because what's really important with water base is that your platens are warm enough so that you are starting to gel the ink from the bottom as well as from, from the top. Um, there's other tools that they also make, but it eats up ahead. So whether it's like an inline heat press or um, like rock as an iron, what's it called, an m and hothead? Uh, like those also help a lot too. Like in, in our shop, we have an inline heat press on every press that we have. And it... I call it like supercharging the palettes where it basically warms them up enough that like we don't have like screen to screen pickup issues like that. Yeah, and also depending on how you're running the press, you might want to look at just getting an infrared flash and putting it in your offload station if you're running the press by yourself. Um, that way your palette, by the time it you know cycles around, you're still maintaining the heat in it. Um, but it's really critical, like Eric said, the heat of the palette is pretty much everything. Before you print start, you know, for sure, you got to pre preheat the pallets, make sure they're up to a, you know, a good temp. I like to be around 130 before I even start, which a lot of people think is super hot. But um, a lot of the wet on wet ability comes from the heat of the pallet. If you don't have your pallet warm, it doesn't have the, the proper temp to off gas and, um, you know, gel that, that top layer of ink. So I would say maybe a second flash in the offload. Um, if not, get everything much hotter before you start. Um, and maybe a little bit more ink in the screen for that. A, a really good sort of simple tip is buy a probe. 
find out what temperature they're actually at, a physical, give it a number. They'll put your hand on it and think, yeah, that's a warm enough. Find the number where it works, but more importantly, find the number where it fails. On, on that sort of setup, between 80 and 100. Probably not quite as high as the ones. The, the other thing too that is, I think, uh, not talked about and it's kind of common sense is like, what does your ink deposit look like? Are you running, you know, six uh, 80 mesh or 110 screens or are you doing, you know, 230 mesh? Like the deposit is also going to change that as well. Because if you have a thin layer of ink going down, you'll be less likely to have pickup on the next screen. Whereas if you're, you know, smashing that through and you have a giant, uh, you know, a giant layer going down, it's going to pick up for sure. Besides the mesh that you pick, um, you need to have good tension on your screens, consistent tension on your screens. If you're printing one on wet plastol, water base, whatever, if your screens aren't good, you're screwed. Also, your squeegees cannot be crappy. And uh, I think squeegees are maybe the most underestimated uh, tool in your whole arsenal. I've been to shops that buy a press and two years later have the same squeegees that they should have taken out the day they bought it and they're still there two years later and you need to have the right squeegees. If you're saving money on squeegees, that also is really stupid. I will just say that. And you should get usually triple durometers of various kinds. You don't need a whole lot of different kinds, but you need to have good squeegees that have a good edge on them. You also need to have your press you know, that kind of press is a little harder to uh, level and stuff. That We have MHMs, it's harder, but make your, your press, everything has to be level. Your screens have to be in the right place. If your things are tilted, you're going to be printing with more uh, ink than you need so you don't have a dry brush, so you're going to be all messed up when you try to print wet on wet. So those are all basics that if you don't consider those, you're going to have a hard time. Yeah, everybody agree? And a big thing is the ink technology. The ink technology, not all inks print wet on wet. So um, it's, it's really key that you're, the, the ink that you're starting with has that uh, capability. Otherwise, you're just, you're wasting time. And you're using the ink right, right? Uh, putting the right bases or whatever. Right? Exactly. Yeah, everything's got to go hand in hand. So um, wet on wet with water base is definitely, uh, I don't know that I would call it hard, but once you... Yeah, it takes time to figure out. Once you once you figure out what your press, palette temps, what inks to use, how much ink to put in the screens, what you know, all that, it's pretty easy to do. And easier than plastisome some in certain ways, right? Yeah, I would say so. I'll throw a question out there. What's the maximum number of wet on wet colours with water based you can realistically achieve? Because we know with Plastisol, we've got an almost no open limit. We can get eight, nine colors, wet on wet, and it doesn't give us any issue. What about with water-based? Is that limit still as high? For, for my experience, it wasn't the amount of colors. It was how long did it take for my palette to lose the temperature. So if I did not lose the temperature, I feel like I could print 20 colors. But at color five, six, my palette's starting to cool off to where that's when I start to have issues. So for me, it's just how long can your press uh, maintain the temp of the palette? All right, other questions? Water-based printing? You're allowed more than one question. Well, thank you, I have many questions. Keep uh, it on, keep, <laughs> keep them coming, brother. So after I put like the trifecta in there for like Matsui, I just kind of put the Pantone number on there, throw it back on the shelf, and then if it has like chunks, I kind of give it the drill press with a little bit of water. Is there something I'm doing wrong, or what would you recommend for like extra ink? <laughs> well, are the chunks like dried up ink? Or, I don't know if. Yeah. Are, are the chunks dried up ink? Yeah, they're sometimes dried up, and sometimes I've even had them, like, separate, so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, definitely dr drill mixing it from the beginning when you're mixing the inks. Um, you want to use whatever additives that you're, are, are you using additives as well? Yeah, mix those in um, at the beginning, and then when you're taking it off the screen, you're never putting um, dehydrated ink back in that container. You can reuse the ink for sure, but you want to make sure it's it's hydrated and you're removing anything that that looks chunky. <laughs> you never want to put that back in the ink to try to drill mix it. 
Yeah, like an, if it does kind of contaminate your ink or come back into it, you want to try and pull that out because you're going to have problems on press and it will start to dry out and dehydrate your ink on press like even faster. It's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the term, but basically like it, it's it's the first step of your ink starting to fail and if that's sitting in there, it's going to start failing even faster. Yeah, the one thing that I was going to say with this is I talked about this at the last water base discussion that I did was you almost have to treat your inks like a food product. So if you have, you know, you, you cook yourself dinner and you have uh, a cup of, uh, you know, I don't know, mayonnaise that you use for dinner and the dried up crust on the outside, you don't want that to fall back in and eat that the next time, right? That's gross. So like, I look at my ink the same way. Like if something gets in it, it's gotta come out. Like I don't want it in my food just like I don't want it in my ink. So my mindset was always in the ink room, you're treating it like a food product. And I think just that mindset has really helped um, the guys in my facility uh, maintain you know the ink to where it doesn't get crusty and stuff like that but recycling and re reusing the ink um, you know that that's a big part of what you need to do so taking a little bit more time making sure it's done right making sure the lids on tight that's that's all good stuff to do yeah I'm just gonna agree with everything there with water based ink we're fighting evaporation the whole time when we're mixing it when it's out on press when it's in the screen it, the water is leaving it so we're fighting that the whole time. So at some point, we're gonna to have to put a little bit of water back in and keeping that consistency, knowing that you've got that good consistency, that's the skill you're gonna to have to learn. If you go too far with the water, you're gonna break it down. It's gonna look not opaque and not bright on the press. And if you don't, it's gonna climb up the back of the squeegee and cause you a nightmare. So it's finding that right balance, knowing that the temperature in your shop, you're losing water the whole time the ink is loose. Like balance and control is key really to all of these things. So what about humidification uh, in the room that you're printing in? Do, is that this help? I mean, I've seen like crazy stuff where it looks like a, like I mean, a water feature, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I, I can't, you know, on your press, that seems like really ridiculous. So, but what, what things do help that are not ridiculous? We're in Houston, so we have super high humidity, but we have a whole shop humidification system. It's like a cool thing to like see happen, but I don't think it really matters. It's not needed if you build your ink correctly. And uh, again, it's it's cool to see the you know the moisture spray out. But Danny, you've been there. Like it doesn't it doesn't do anything. So if you build your inks properly and you balance them properly, you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I agree. The the humidification it looks great. It's like a dragon sat on top of the press at some point, but also. A little spray bottle for a plant sprayer works just as well. So you don't have to go all in for the for the puff the magic dragon that sits on top of the press. Danny, up in Colorado where you guys have lower humidity, I mean, have you found that you need, like I know sometimes you use a reptile fogger, right, on, on the head, but even that, like I feel like you use it less and less. Yeah, I mean, when we first started the transition, we were pretty much fogging most colors, most whites. Um, and like Eric said, once we learned how to build the colors, uh, using the additives, using the bases correctly, we didn't need to continue to fog. So it's fogging and, you know, it's kind of a band-aid for inks that aren't built correctly. And, and I'd say to you, so my production manager, that's Tim right there, he's running uh, one of the rock presses and we're printing all water base. Like I, the humidity in that room is low, um, but we've been using the same ink for three days. It's still running fine. So, I mean, again, once it's built right, you're, you're good. Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest tips, and I know Eric use it is, uses it in his shop, is the foundation of what you're printing on. So your underbase with water-based printing is the most important thing. If you build your top colors with clear bases that, um, the, the clear bases are very open, right? You can almost put them in a screen, leave them in a screen all day long. Um, the key is creating the base that, where it's optically bright enough to where you can put a translucent color on top and still maintain that opacity. So your base is like literally everything for water-based printing. It's good you call it base. We've heard from Dave Gardner yesterday that under base was a joke because it's actually redundant. So yeah, the base. Um, all right, uh, other questions for these folks? Uh, I keep hearing the mention of building the inks. 
Um, and I guess back to it with the bases, with the clears and the whites. What are some, I guess, some tips to choosing the right way to to mix it right? Like, when do you know to add maybe less clear or more white? Uh, is there certain shirt types that will tell you to do that? Or I know experience will too, but I guess some shortcuts if um, if you guys can. Uh, you said you were using Matsui, or yeah. you, your question yeah, basically Matsui. is Matsui. Get get with Jesse um, and ask those questions. Of- <laughs> specifically on what you're trying to to print on um because there's a million ways to to build your inks and it's really going to be dependent on how you're using it so i'd i'd ask him <laughs> or just start throwing stuff up on press and try it like a lot of what we've learned is from failing and like i i think the biggest tip i kind of tell everyone when you're getting into water base is like you have to accept that you're going to fuck up a lot of things. You have to be okay with it. Um, you have to know you're going to lose money, you're going to lose time. But through those failures, you're going to find how you move forward from there. Amen. All right, other questions? How about a hand for these guys? 